welcome to lecture 7 of computational geometry. Uh, we will start on a new topic, a rather interesting topic uh, in the context of computational geometry, namely convex hulls. Um, but before I get into the convex hull problem, uh, just let me know if there are any questions from the last lecture. Right. So, I hope that you know uh, you understood the basic uh, essence of uh, what I what I am calling it interval trees, right. So, interval trees are rather useful in, in many other contexts as we will see later, uh, particularly when we deal with things called uh, range searching, okay. Uh, but I just thought I would bring up one thing to your notice. So, uh, we did this example last time for the interval trees and uh, uh, you know we, we observed that for any interval, uh, the maximum number of allocation nodes um, for a interval tree of size, uh, sorry, of n leaf nodes is at most 2 times log n, right. Um, and you know we kind of informally even proved it, you know you can, you can formalize the proof um, and refine it. Uh, uh, but there is, I just realized that there may be an easier explanation of the whole thing. If you think about the interval, um, so interval is, uh, let us say this is, uh, oh I cannot write this PDF file. So the interval is, uh, let us say L comma R, in this case L equal to 10 and R equal to 13. So, when we do this allocation, you know we encounter what is called a fork node, where the path splits into 2 paths, right. Initially the interval is small enough that it will actually not uh, span the entire node. So, it will uh, and it will fall to either left or the right subtree. So, you, you keep traveling till you hit a node where part of the interval is to the right of this uh, node and part of the interval is to the on the right subtree of this node and that is what is called the fork node. So, at the fork node, uh, uh, so, for every node there is kind of a, you know, a, a splitting value, right. For the node a 9 comma 15, you know all the values less than 12 are on the left hand side and all the values greater than 12 on the right hand side. So, now since the interval splits into 2 parts, okay, the, the part of the left interval okay, will be basically is beginning from 12, you know up to or let us say you know it is it's L comma 12. Okay. So, if it is L comma 12, the, the right interval is 12 comma R. So, allocation nodes, so we have to find allocation nodes in the left subtree for the length 12 minus L and in the right subtree we have to find it for the length R minus 12, correct. Now, you can actually think about this whole thing as a, you know, you can, it, it is very analogous to the binary representation because you know these trees are basically chunks of you know uh, you know 2 and 4 and 8 and so on and so forth right so we are trying to find the allocation nodes of the left sub interval which is of length 12 minus l so any binary representation can have at most log n bits okay it's not even log n you know it, it, it will depend on the length so if the length is b bits so it will be not be more than b bits actually b b allocation nodes Okay. So, that is another way of you know sort of justifying or it is all it is actually like a like a like a formula that you can even without uh, actually uh, doing the allocation in the tree, I can actually figure out analytically which nodes it will be allotted to. Right. So, that is another way of thinking about it, just, just a small observation. Okay, so, uh, so, we will come back to this notion of interval tree. In fact, this interval tree forms the you know also known as some variation is known as, as a segment tree, some variation is known as range trees is something that we will again touch upon you know in, in near future. Okay. For today, we will uh, we'll start on this topic called convex hulls. Yes. Uh, the, what is the question? Why do we need to find the median? Why, why do not we need? As, as, you la, as you said in the last class that uh, we do not need the trees to be balanced. No, no, no. I did not say that. I said the tree has to be balanced. Okay. So, if it is, uh, if it is balanced, then uh, we need to find out median at every… Uh, right, right. So, that will add some complexity or some factory of this. No. So, in any case the tree, how much time do you think the tree takes to be constructed? n log n. So, even if you find the median at every level, it will still be n log n. See, you are actually you are actually starting with a sorted uh, va set of values. So, you know the median is already there, that information is already there. 
right? And even if it were not there, you know, you find the median of n intake order n time, then you are finding median of two sets of size n over 2 that will also take order n time. So, even if you had to find the median, it will still take n, it still be n log n. So, that does not add to any complexity, right? Okay, so convex hulls, uh, I believe lot of you uh, it would have be, be many of you will be familiar with, uh, but you know nevertheless let me go through some of the formal definitions. So before defining even convex hull, let me define the notion of what is called a convex set. Okay, and this is this is in the in the in the geometric setting. Okay, so a convex set. Okay, basically satisfies um, so convex set. Let us say uh, convex set X. Okay, is a subset of. So if you are talking about plane, and we are talking about uh, R square. Okay. Uh, satisfies the following property. Hmm. For any two points P Q in X, okay, the convex linear combination i lambda p plus 1 minus lambda q also belong to x for lambda between 0 and 1 right? or in other words this segment the entire segment p q lies within the set. So, let me draw an example. So, when you are talking about P and Q, these are vectors, right? They are two dimensional points. And this uh, this definition you know extends to any dimension, right? So, what is it? So, if you have a set like this, and I can have various sets, I can have a set like this, I can have a set like this, I can have a set like this. Right? Now, if, if I take two points P Q, uh, so, suppose I take points P Q, it says the entire segment lies within the set. So, this is my x. So, that is one example. I can take P Q to be this, the entire segment lies within the set, but the definition says for any two points. Okay. So, but if I take P and Q to be this, the entire segment does not lie within X. Okay. So, by this definition, this is not convex. Not convex. Right. How about this? Again, if I choose these two points, this segment does not lie completely within the set x. Okay. So, again this is not convex. Okay. So, convex is something essentially you know, something like a fat this thing. Okay. So, not uh, yeah. um, and in higher dimension again it, it is an analogous extension. Okay. So, for a for uh, for any any subset of uh, in three dimension again you take any two points in the set the entire segment should lie within the set only then it is convex. Now, what is convex hull? Okay. So, convex hull is defined actually uh, for a set of given objects. Okay. So, convex hull is 
something of S. Okay, S is a given set of objects. Now, objects could be anything, you know, points, lines, whatever, you know, triangles, this, that. So, let us understand the basic definition with respect to point sets. Okay. Suppose, S is a set of is a finite, well not necessarily, but I am saying that let's suppose S is a finite set of points. Right. Then the convex hull of S is the smallest. Okay. Smallest convex set that contains S. Okay. Example. So, I have suppose these are the, my given set of points S. Right? I want to uh, we want to define some kind of a region which must be convex and contains all the points. Right? So, of course, you know I could have um, A circle is a disk is convex essentially. Okay, so I could have a large enough disk that contains all the points. Right, but then it also says something about being the smallest. Okay, so this is clearly not the smallest because I can sort of shrink the disk. You can look at this example and you know sort of shrink the disk and make it a little smaller. Right, so I can you know, sort of cut corners. Containment. Containment. It happens that it so happens that it is also in terms of area, it is also in terms of parameter, uh, perimeter, but uh, let us stick to the containment part. Okay. So, uh, the smallest convex set means that you know the one that I have now drawn in, 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 in dashes, you know, is completely contained within the previous one, and this also contains the given set of points. Right. You can, you know, s struggle a little bit more and you know you know maybe even even make it smaller okay so why even have uh, some kind of a curve okay so maybe we should have something like this okay so what i have drawn right now is uh, with straight line segments connecting some points so visually, at least, uh, is it clear that you know you can't make it or make can't shrink it any further? Hmm? See, these uh, it must contain. It must be convex. It must contain all the all the points, and it must be the smallest, right? So this one contains the one that I drawn the straight line segments. You know, contains all the points. Some of the points are actually on the boundary. Okay, so th that's the boundary of the convex hull, and uh, some of the points are inside. Okay. And if I want to make it any smaller, okay, there is a problem. The problem is that you look at the at the at the corner points, okay. You know these must be in the convex hull, okay. So I can't uh, I can't ignore them, okay. And if I try to make it any smaller, okay, what do I have to do? I have to sort of maybe do some bending like this because those points must appear on the uh, there, there must be on the convex. Uh, sorry, the, the the points must be included in the convex uh, hull. Okay, so the my only chance is to sort of try to bend these things. Okay, or uh, the other option is to you know have some holes. But then we just notice that if there is a hole, okay, if there is a hole, then it doesn't satisfy the property of convexity because then I can have two points P and Q, and the entire segment is not going to be contained. So it cannot have any perforations. Okay, the boundary cannot be uh, the boundary cannot be bent inwards okay. 
otherwise the same problem that you know I have these two points the uh, two points in the boundary draw it by join it by a straight line as the entire straight line is not going to be contained in the convex hull. Okay. So, uh, so at least uh, informally this seems like you know we have actually hit upon the smallest uh, uh, convex set which is also you know by definition a convex polygon. So, it is a polygon. Okay. So, a convex in two dimension a, a convex uh, smallest convex set is a convex polygon. Okay. So, it is a convex polygon. Now, I just, uh, just made uh, a few comments that uh, it turns out that uh, you know it can be proved that the convex hull is uh, is also the smallest convex smallest area convex polygon containing the set of points it turns out to be the smallest uh, uh, convex po uh, is, uh, in, in terms of perimeter also okay. it, so these are properties that can be proved you know i'm not doing it right now okay so it can be proved So, I will write C H for convex hull. So, convex hull S is the smallest convex But they ha these have to be rigorously proved. Right? But I'm just making these observations. The next question is: uh, Okay, let me also define these things. So some points. Now, again you can argue that some points must be on the boundary of the convex hull otherwise you can squeeze it further. right? If there are no points on the boundary you know I, I should be able to at least infinite similarly somehow shrink the boundary. Right? So, some points have to be on the boundary and these are called corner points or boundary points. And the boundary of the convex hull is an ordered chain, either you can call it a vertices of vertices or edges, whatever you call. So, a subset of the points the finite set of points that are given to us will define the corner points or the boundary of the convex hull right and the d a description of the convex hull is an ordered chain which is basically some subset of the given set of points right. that could be also a natural representation of the convex hull right. this is by the way this is only for two dimension the similar definition analogous definition extends to three dimensions. Now, once you go to three dimensions then there is no notion of this ordering anymore. Okay. Other definitions go through okay. that you know there will be some points on the boundary again same thing um, and uh, it will be a convex what is called a convex polyhedron okay. convex polyhedron convex polytope what you call it. Uh, but then the, the, the boundary of the convex hull is no longer something that can be ordered like we can do in two dimensions okay but it is a more complex structure okay is think about it like a football or something you know the the boundary of the football okay um, we will probably discuss a little bit about that but right now let's focus on on the two dimensional convex hull okay so how do we construct a two dimensional convex hull 
So, given a set of points, so the algorithmic question is that given a set S of n points, how do we construct C H of S? Hmm. Okay, that's an idea actually. So let me articulate what is being said. So what is being said is the following. Let me use the other medium. So let me not. So let's just. Okay. So what is being proposed here is that you take some of these points given to you. you draw the pairwise lines, all possible lines, well there are too many of them, I cannot draw all of them. Right. So, you, you draw all these n choose two lines right. and then perform a line sweep, okay. that is what is being said. So, you perform a line sweep. Okay and at any point okay the so what is what is being said here the what 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 is it that going to define the convex r what is an event point here which points or the given set of points or the intersection of the lines the given set of points okay so the given set of points is are all the event points and as you sweep past okay what do you do keep track of what is the minimum and maximum in no let 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 let's 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 explore that first so um, the so the minimum and maximum of what of y value of the lines of the lines Okay, okay, okay. So you are saying the event points are the points, the given set of points. The event points are is basically S, okay, and uh, boundaries uh, boundary of convex hull will be the what? What are you saying the which lines? So, there are many lines that can intersect. So, at this point, you know, so there are many lines that are intersecting. So, which is going to define the boundary? The minimum, no, the maximum, the minimum, the minimum. Connected to the event point, but uh, I see. Okay. So, what you are saying is that there are a number of uh, so this event point or whatever there are many points so each point basically uh, defines n minus 1 lines right there are n points so you're saying that you know you look at all these things okay and as you cross the minimum in terms of y so after i cross this this should be basically what should define the boundary right and then after this the minimum and so on and so forth of course uh, there could be some complication like this so what are you going to do about this no, just just wait a minute. So no. there there is some there is there is some ambiguity here, right? So this is one possible which should be actually the convex hull mm -hmm. boundary, but then this is minimum, right? So what are you going to do about it? No, but uh, no. But then I could have a point here. I could have a point here. I thought you are saying minimum. No, maximum and maximum. Maximum, maximum, maximum will be both are. At each point, you are uh, finding the upper boundary as well as the lower boundary. No, no, but this is not the lower boundary. Why should this be lower boundary? The lower boundary will be boundary. the lower boundary will be something like this. No, so why should I miss this? And uh, because there is a there is one point which is lying below this. There is one line which is below this, 
and there is a line above it. So the convertibility is possible. No, there is a there is a line above it. There, there are many lines. Which is the one that you are following? The highest one. And no, this is the highest one. Okay, so I am not saying that these things will not work out, but I think it's. Uh, I think there could be simpler attempts, you know, and then we will look at. You know, this can probably be refined into some kind of algorithm, uh, but it's not going to be particularly. Uh, so we have drawn the nth choose two lines, so it's at least n square, and then we are doing line sweep, and you have to do event points. So what you're saying, you know, I think can be refined into a proper algorithm, but. Uh, why not think about something even simpler? <laughs> so, can you tell me uh, which point must be on the boundary of the convex circle? Can you? Uh, right. So, the topmost and the bottommost point must be on the convex hull. Is that clear? So, is the leftmost and the rightmost, right? So, once I know there is some point on the convex hull, so let's uh, look at another example. Okay. So, these are given, this is a given set uh, S and this is the leftmost point. Okay. I have identified this is the leftmost point in terms of x coordinate. So, this point must be on the convex hull. Can you argue why? This one, the one that is circled. Oh. Yes, fine. Sorry. So this point. So was the previous uh, diagram visible when we were looking at it? Okay, fine. So okay. So now I'm defining another set of giving another set of points, and this is the leftmost point, right? So why should the leftmost point be on the boundary? Yeah, that's the question. So why can't the boundary? So why why does this point have to be in the boundary? Why isn't the why isn't the convex hull something like this? Okay, for this actually there is a uh, you know a, a better characterization. So I didn't quite characterize the boundary points. So boundary points can also be thought about as okay. Let me write here. Um, the boundary points are also such that uh, you can draw what is called a, a, a tangent through a boundary point, and a tangent is a line that passes through a point, and the remaining points should be to one side of the tangent. Okay, so there is a notion of so boundary point and tangent. Okay, so let me write it here. A boundary point supports a tangent, i.e., it the a line that passes.
So, if, you, if, if this is the characterization of another characterization of boundary point, then clearly this is enough to say that you know if I draw a, a vertical line through the leftmost point, okay, clearly all other points should be to the right of it and therefore, it must be a boundary point. Right? In fact, this is a you know a pretty useful characterization of a boundary point. Right? And by that actually, you know whichever orientation you choose, whether it is you know this orientation or this orientation in along any orientation, okay. You, you can very uh, easily see that okay, so this point must be boundary point because you know along that orientation this is the right most or whatever this is an extreme point so an extreme point or a boundary point is uh, can always support a tangent because you can draw a line through it so that the remaining points will be to one side of it okay um, okay so the leftmost point is on the boundary that is that is given to us now what we can do is you can think about this uh, convex hull again as uh, you know if if these were something like nails uh, that we we have, we have driven onto the plane you put a rubber band around it okay the convex hull takes the shape basically of the, the whatever shape the rubber band takes that's also the convex hull it's it's kind of tight between two boundary points and you know straight line segments joining them okay so so once i have identified one convex hull okay I can imagine that I am going to tie a rope around this sort of circle a rope around this and whichever points I hit basically should define the boundary points of the convex hull. Okay. So, once I have identified let us say L which is the leftmost point to get the next point okay, all I am saying is that I take a rope okay, and just try to tie it around. So, we can move the rope till it hits this one okay so this is the next point of support of that rope okay and then of course i i i side i draw this you know the rope basically is tight around this then again you know i again tie the rope okay i, I pull the rope okay and then it meets the next support point okay and like this basically i I'll, I'll, I'll end up identifying the boundary points I thought that this would be a, a more natural way of uh, finding the convex hull. And if uh, you do this procedure, okay, what is the running time, and how many operations are we doing, and how do we even execute this thing? I mean, we are not physically actually going to pull a rope around. So algorithmically, how should we do it? Yeah, so it appears, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, right. So it appears that we are actually talking about something like angles, right? So, so if you look at this point, you know, we, we draw this uh, all possible. So if you join it with the other points, okay, okay, and you measure your angle in the anticlockwise direction or something, then, uh, well, how do how do you like to measure the angle? Um, Well, we are we are actually uh, trying to walk uh, in a clockwise manner, right? So, which is the slope that we should see? How? Uh, what is this point basically? Right. So, no, no. If you're if you're ma measuring angle in the anticlockwise direction, this maximizes the angle, right? So, if this is the theta, so you know uh, every one, every all these points will define some theta one, theta two, etc., up to theta n minus one, and the max of that will be the next point of support right then the next stage going out of there and likewise you continue from here and so on and so forth so we can say max and minimum both will be yeah but you know we are if you are if you're just sort of tying the rope around i mean you're going in one direction you are going to trace it like that right so, so we have to assume that all the points are in the first quadrant because otherwise some theta can be you can always change the axis right i mean change the change the frame of reference when what wherever whichever point you are in you 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 change your frame your reference so that everything is in in the in the in the positive quadrant mm -hmm. so how do you do angle com computation <laughs> we can't measure the length like that right So, which, which, which 
change to polar coordinates, you know, we do some. So, well, one way of defining angle is, you know, you take, you, you can take this, so you, you can, uh, you can compute either uh, cross product or dot product, right. You know, you can treat these points, you can take this as origin, compute the dot products, okay, and then uh, of course, from there, from the, and from the lens, you can, well, you normalize them, you normalize them, and you can, you can compute either sine inverse or cos inverse, you know, either you, uh, the dot product or the cross product, whichever you are more comfortable with, okay. So, yeah, yeah, so both will be normalized in some sense, you know, whatever it is, so you, you can normalize and get it. So, that will amount to, so if we want explicit angles, then uh, we need to do, you know, inverse trigonometric functions, right. That is a very good observation, okay. that is a very good observation. So, are you saying that we can, we may not want to actually compute the theta, but you know just from the fact that you know we know sin theta, we can make some observations about that. Okay. that yeah, and uh, we can even just find out the difference between y coordinates and the length of the perpendicular in the right angle triangle as that decreases such angle theta decreases. So, the okay. value of that y Okay, so good. So, I am very happy that you know the people have quickly realized that we need not actually uh, do inverse trigonometric function because these are you know transcendental functions and there is no real really good arithmetic model for this you know so we can only do some kind of approximation okay so at this point we would like to avoid trigonometric functions okay we would only like to use normal arithmetic functions like you know um, multiplications divisions uh, perhaps maybe square root at this point i'm not even talking about square root okay to the extent possible we should stick with the algebraic functions okay not uh, use trigonometric functions okay. and and the observation was that you know uh, even by just computing sin theta and without the theta we can perhaps compare two angles right sin if i if i know sin theta 1 and sin theta 2 you know i will i should be able to do some comparisons between theta 1 and theta 2 great okay I will suggest another method and this will be actually something similar to this, but it will be more useful and, and, and it is more standard. Okay. And for that, uh, we will rely on essentially the cross product thing. Okay. Uh, so, can't we see just the maximum value of y minus y to y y to minus y. Y. The maximum value of that length of the perpendicular will give us a point at the height. No, no, I am not sure what you are saying. Yeah. Large, uh, highest value of y. Highest value of this could be much higher, you know. No, 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 no. So, those kind of things will not work. See, it is a two dimensional problem. So, you have a point, okay. You can have a very high exponential, uh, but you know that it will go like this. So, this is not the next point. No, no, this, this is not the highest value, this is the highest value, right. So, no, you cannot, you cannot simplify like that. So, let, let me give you a, 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 a sort of more, uh, you know, uh, computationally more uh, meaningful way of doing it, okay. So, for that, you know, just recall uh, the formula for area of triangle. So, I have let us say three points uh, A, well, A, D, C. Okay. Um, let us call them x 1, y 1, x 2, y 2, x 3, y 3. Does anyone Remember the formula for the area of this triangle. Great, good. Okay, okay. Tell me. So x one, y one one, 
Okay, great. Good. You have a good memory. Okay. And the? Half of this determinant. Okay. Half of this. Great. So, this is the area of the triangle. And this actually is derived from the uh, from the cross product. So, the area of this triangle actually I mean to be more precise the area of this triangle is actually the absolute value of But if you look at the signed area that is I do not take the absolute value ok. The signed area ok depends on if the yeah Order. if the points are clockwise great. So, you remember a lot of your analytical geometry clockwise. So, clockwise and anti clockwise. So, the way we wrote it read down here x 1 x 2 x 3. So, right. So, it, it is actually clockwise ok. So, in the case of clockwise it turns out it should be negative and the counter clockwise it is positive. So, you will know either you are going like this or going like that ok. Now, this turns out to be a very useful primitive for a lot of geometric problems ok including this one and how is that? Right. Exactly. So, this is essentially a left turn or a right turn primitive ok. So, when it is clockwise ok it is right turn ok when it is counter clockwise it is a left turn ok. But in the in the three point in the order of the three points A B C is a right turn and A C B is a left turn right. Now, you see the when we are looking at finding the the uh, the let us say the largest angle in the counter clockwise direction ok. Essentially you know let us say this is the leftmost point ok L ok. We are looking to eliminate one of the two points you know whatever these points are let us say you know P i and P j. Right. So, I need to know whether you know we are uh, you know P j is like this or like this. No, but I am avoiding I do not want to I am not even I do not even have to find the slopes explicitly. The good thing about this determinant is that you know it do not have to do even divisions anything it just multiplication right right. We want to avoid division to the extent possible. So, just by figuring out whether you know L P i P j is a left turn or a right turn we know whether to eliminate P i or to P or, or P j. So, it is like a like a like whatever like a minimum or a maximum computation right. So, I have this this point the anchor point ok and for the remaining points I am just trying to find out and whenever you know we, we compare two points ok we will retain the one ok that basically is the right turn. So, this point will get eliminated and this will remain then we take pick up another point maybe this one and then this point will get eliminated and this will remain. It is like basically a minimum maximum computation except that the primitive that is being used is this left turn right turn right. And it is a purely algebraic function you know no trigonometric computations no angles you know not even division So, this turns out to be a very useful primitive for many other geometric problems and if you think about it convex hull is sort of the first problem we are looking at which truly ha is a, has a two dimensional character you know the previous problems we looked at um, you know uh, your 2 d maximum etcetera we could only do with the comparison model you know there are no there are no need for any kind of slopes and things like that you know we just had to take you know, compare the x coordinates or the y coordinates you know nothing else was required convex hull you know we are we do require some kind of slope computation, but we are able to circumvent that using another kind of primitive ok. But it certainly it is not it is it is not a problem where you can just do use comparisons that will not suffice ok. 
it's not some just less than or greater than. No, we we are actually we have to compute the determinant or something else, something that will give us some idea about the slope. Okay. So this left turn, right turn will turn out to be useful for many other applications. Okay. So if this is the case, you use this primitive, then clearly the running time of this thing that we just uh, talked about, how what will be that? Right. Yeah. So it's like a maximum minimum computation at every step. Okay. So this uh, you know this naive simple algorithm simple uh, it's uh, it has it has actually a name also so you know it's uh, called uh, it's called uh, jarvis's march actually you know for whatever it is worth you know. jarvis's march okay takes uh, order okay so I will actually be more precise in writing this. I will say it takes n times h, where h is the number of boundary points. What is the smallest convex hull? Triangle. Triangle, right? Nothing can be that because that's the smallest convex polygon. Right. So if it so happens that your input is like this. Okay, and all other points are inside. This gives you a, a linear time algorithm actually. Right. So it's not, it's pretty good. And when the number of boundary points is small, okay, but when the number of uh, all the points could be on the boundary, and then you are in an n square kind of a situation, which is what even that complicated thing about joining every pair of points, you know, uh, join them with line and doing a line sweep, would give you something even more than n square because you have to do a line sweep with n square. Uh, lines. Right. So, this is simpler and you know it is uh, in the worst case it is n square, but then for some cases it is n h. Right. Question is that you know can we do better? Th that always is the question can we do better. So, faster algorithms. Right. So, I will only just give you the idea and we will uh, do the analysis tomorrow next class. Um, so, for that what I will do is I will define the notion of what is called a upper hull and a lower hull. Okay. So, if you are given these points and we identify the leftmost point. So, this is the leftmost point identify the rightmost point, this is the rightmost point. Let us join it by a line. Okay. So, all points above the line okay, and these are all points, so call it u and all points below the line call it L. Okay. So, I have these two I have, I have I just have these two disjoint uh, subsets of points. Okay. The upper hull is basically the part of the convex hull that is above this boundary. Okay, so, I let me have some more points. So, this is my upper hull okay. and the part below the boundary in green is your lower hull. Okay. This is my upper hull, this is my lower hull. Now, why have we defined this? So, uh, what we will do is that you know we will we can identify the leftmost and the rightmost point in linear time okay, and separate out these two point sets subsets L and U and we will just describe the algorithm for the upper hull and for the lower hull it will be an identical analogous algorithm. So, okay. so we will only focus on constructing the upper hull. Right. So, so how do we construct the upper hull? That is what we are going to focus on. Right. 
Yeah, you just paste them. You just paste them. It's not strictly merging. It's just you know the part of the hull that is above the line, the part of the hull is below the line. So if I can construct the upper hull and I can construct the lower hull, you know there is no real merging. It's just pasting. Yes. So is that uh, is that clear or not clear? No, no, there is a point. So, you should be able to argue it on the basis of uh, see, you know, you can think about the upper hull as uh, okay. So, you can think about the up. So, this is this is my separating line, you know, this is my upper hull, okay, and there is some lower hull, okay. The way to think about this, you know, which is clean, is that you should think about a the intersection of this unbounded thing. And the intersection of this, and that will be this. Okay. And uh, uh, there is one thing I did not mention that uh, the intersection of two convex sets is always convex. <laughs> By definition, if you can think about it, because you know the, the entire segment should be con completely contained in the set right so uh, if you look at the intersection it, it it lies in both and therefore the intersection is also convex right in fact uh, half plane is a very good example of a convex set right. actually let me stop here today i think i'll i'll resume tomorrow yes.